We may have some more people joining us. Um, my name is Carrie Whalen Megley. I'm the Executive Director of Family Ties of Westchester. And on behalf of my colleagues and some of our family members that are joining us tonight, as well as our partners at WCA, we want to welcome everybody to this town hall um, around re remote learning. So we've got a full schedule, um, and we're really fortunate to, to have some of our senators, our assemblymen, and I think some local legislators here. Um, so we want to get started. As you mentioned, quick housekeeping. We're asking everybody, I think Josh has muted everyone. If you have a question, we have a short Q&A period at the end. So we will try to get some um, questions in and we also encourage people to chat anything if they have questions or concerns in the box. And Tammy is helping monitor that so we'll make sure we get to everybody. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Family Ties of Westchester, we are Westchester County's only independent family peer support and advocacy organization. And for 30 years, we partnered with local government with, and with other provider organizations across the human service sector to make sure that kids and families with unmet behavioral health needs, trauma, and other life challenges have access to the tools and resources that they need to achieve good health and emotional well-being. We um, partner with kids and families here in Westchester County using something called the System of Care Framework. And one of our architects of that model is joining us tonight. Um, Myra Alfreds. And the foundations of this framework really are about family voice, about making sure we maintain a strength-based perspective, that we collaborate across systems and across provider organizations and listening to families, and that we're accountable, that we're accountable to each other, to the families that we serve, and to our community partners. So tonight's event is really born out of these values as well as a commitment um, to equity and to social justice that is so crucial, particularly right now. And one of the things that we've learned when we do this work and we think about lasting and accountable systemic change, there's really three ingredients. And I'm really excited because I think we've got all three of them here tonight. And we really start with number one, the voices of individuals with lived experience. So that's our kids and families. And we depend on them to tell us and, and we support them in sharing what works, what's helped and what's harmed them in this process. Then we need research and advocacy organizations like WCA, like Student Advocacy, who collect the data and help us create and formulate actionable advocacy agendas. And finally, what I'm thrilled about is we need seasoned and dedicated um, public servants, like the many that we have here this evening, who are willing to listen to their constituents and are willing to fight for a legislative agenda that meets their needs. So I'm really excited. We pulled this together very last minute, but I'm so excited that everybody's here to join us. And I think we have the beginnings of a wonderful conversation that I think will help us rethink the promise of a public education in these crazy and uncertain times. I hope we learn some things here that let us um, think about how we can move forward beyond this. And we really want to make sure that we think about what the promise of a public education is and how do we make sure that all kids and families are, are able to access the education that they need. Um, and so that's really kind of the point here. I'm not going to talk any longer. I'm going to turn it over to Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins, a lifelong advocate for Westchester County and a powerful um, advocate for kids and families here. So we're thrilled that you're here to join us and I'll let you introduce your colleagues when you're done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carrie. And it's so good to be with you. I was motivated in hearing your introduction and remembering my introduction to Family Ties happened when I was in the county legislature and you would help someone had, not, not you, but the organization had helped someone who was struggling with mental illness and uh, to, to get back into being self-sufficient and supporting her in every way. 
and reaching out to my office to be able to support in the ways we could so that she could maintain her home, her kids, and she did. So what you say about family ties is, is absolutely my experience. I also work with you with the grandparents because I know, you know, a lot of my grandparents are raising grandkids and we do things together in support of that. So thank you for your commitment. And certainly for uh, WCA, again, uh, worked with WCA since uh, the beginning of my, my political, my public office career because uh, there's no better authority about the needs of children in Westchester County uh, that, that, as you said, does the data gathering and, and advocacy than Westchester Children's Association. And I, you know, proud of Allison having ascended. And, you know, again, we've had an opportunity to work, whether it was on Raise the Age, which we, we did, and whether it was on, um, you know, a lot of the, the bail reforms and other things that impact our kids. And I know that we're talking about also suspensions and, and you know, trying to figure that piece out as well. And part of my being here is that I can't stay for the whole time, but it's really a, a uh, a salute, frankly, to the work that happens in Westchester County, the collaborative work. Uh, you said I was a lifelong advocate for Westchester. No, I wasn't. Actually, I, <laughs> I, I was uh, spent my my childhood in New York City. I came to Westchester as as an adult uh, with with children, and we we started our family here. But since I've been here, you know, frankly, I've never looked back. And part of that is because of the advocacy that happens within community. We know that Westchester is a, a you know, quote unquote, affluent community. It's a wonderful community. But we also understand that, you know, there are a lot of, of things and, and people who really require, need, expect, and should have uh, opportunities and this is where our focus has been and now you know uh, through my my service of the Senate I've become the Senate majority leader and so that is um, you know extraordinary and as much as uh, I get to lead uh, the majority of the senators um, in New York State and I get to pick and choose who gets to do what and one of the privileges I've had is to ask uh, my good friend and colleague, Shelley Mayer, to head up the Committee on Education for New York State. And obviously that is not an easy task, but I wanted very much to make sure that I had not only someone, and again, both Shelley and I, we have lived experience. We're parents and grandparents. And, you know, I, I also was a former teacher and she's, she's an attorney and, 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 but, you know, the thing that we, we've, we've all struggled with, uh, you know, is, is childcare and, and daycare and, and access to quality education. Certainly I did in, in my family and I public school product, uh, raised in public schools. And I know having traveled the state that there is differences, uh, in what public schools look like from place to place. And so we are dedicated to mitigating those differences. We don't want, you know, nobody should be uh, barred from having quality education, uh, period, and certainly not because of a zip code. So when I asked Shelly to take this on, she knew it was going to be all of it. It was going to be, you know, access. It was going to be listening to parents uh, everywhere, making sure that as we listen to New York City, we also listen to the suburbs, we listen to our rural areas, and we look at where the gaps are. We, we've certainly, you know, tried to bridge the gap, and now here we are in a COVID crisis, and all of a sudden remote learning is the, the uh, you know, order of the day in order to keep ourselves safe and whole. And we've got to figure out uh, how that works. And we have, we have tried in several different ways. And I know Shelly will you know, talk about some of those ways. But again, it's, it's just my opportunity to, to greet you, to thank you for what you're doing, to say that you know, I couldn't have picked a better person to, to navigate 
uh, for us, this education uh, crisis uh, in all of its different aspects and to really keep our eyes focused on the future of our children because we know if they are educated, we are all going to fare better. I also wanna give a shout out, I know County Legislator Christopher Johnson is there. He's a new parent himself. And so he's gonna have all of the experience of, of us, but you know, again, his kid is gonna, you know, just come out of the womb wanting to figure out how to get online, you know, so we gotta figure out this broadband so that 3J, uh, you know, has all the access that he needs. But I'm looking forward to the extent that I can stay on to hear what the parents are saying and to continue to be partners in making sure we get this right. So thank you so much and have a good, good, good town hall. Thank you, uh, Senator Majority Leader. That's awesome. So on that point, Josh, I think we're going to turn it over to you. Um, and I think you've got some questions for some of our family members. Thank you, Carrie. And my name is Josh Pryos. I'm the Program Policy Associate at Westchester Children's Association. I also wanted to thank um, Senator Majority Leader Stuart Cousins for being here, um, Education Chair and Senator Shelley Mayer, as well as Westchester County Legislator Christopher Johnson, who uh, Majority Leader Stuart Cousins just acknowledged as well. Um, so we have some parents on the, the line that we do want to give about three minutes each to ask questions. I'm gonna have a timer just to make sure that we move through, but we are gonna start with Michelle Williams on the financial impact of remote learning on caregivers. I'm gonna look to unmute you, Michelle. Okay. Oh, you can okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Williams, and I've lived in Yonkers for over 30 years. I have eight children, and they range from ages 27, my oldest, to my youngest, um, 10 years old. And they all attended various Yonkers public schools. Um, so um, the youngest four are home. The others have outgrown the nest, so to speak, and um, are doing well. Uh, I just wanted to share with you how COVID have um, affected me adversely. Right now, I'm home with the children because of remote learning. I'm unable to take any case. I do home care. And um, just... Um, not being able to go out to work is a great hardship because I have bills like everybody else, a lot of bills. And the quality of, quality of life that we're used to is just being able to um, have certain things um, that people take for granted, uh, granted um, or just being able to meet, um, make ends meet, for example, we need to do laundry, we need to provide meals, and the list goes on and on. Okay, so because of um, the remote learning, the four that are home, they basically um, have very different schedules, which I have to keep up with, and it's, that creates a lot of challenge, because everyone is in the home at the same time. And that's all I wanted to share. It's just very challenging right now. Thank you, Michelle. Thank so, you for allowing me to share. Josh, one one quick point I wanted to add. I think it was United the Hospital Fund just sent out a report, um, and they were saying over 300,000 children because of COVID-19 have either fallen into poverty or are at risk of falling into poverty just because of um, a family's challenge in, in able, being able to support them. So this is, thank you, Michelle, for sharing that because it's a, it's a huge issue across the state. Thank you for allowing me to share. Okay, thank you, Carrie, for adding that as well. Next, we have Celia Loja on access to tablets, Wi-Fi, and communication, particularly challenges for non-English speaking families. Thank you, Celia, for unmuting. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Celia Loja. I am a family peer advocacy employee to Family Ties of Westchester since 2017. I have been able to reach out to families and talk about their needs and their school settings as related to the remote learning. 
Most of the families are overwhelming because internet service during the remote learning section shut down very often and become stressful to students. These serials affect the pattern and their learning and flow the basic communication. Besides, some families don't have the ability to help their children effectively as they don't speak English fluently. Others are not computing knowledge impedes them getting into links, emails, and virtual learning. So a lot of families are challenging because the level of education is very low and they not even understand their emails. They're not checking the emails frequently. And I'm gonna give you a short example because I have two kids here in Asini. That's what I work. And even my daughter, sometimes while I'm working here in the office, she's saying, mommy, I need help with my homework. And she's really sending me emojis crying. And I can see how the family is strongly with this all remote learning. So that's what the only thing I want to share with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Next, we are going to move to Kyla Brown on the needs of families in remote work and academic support, specifically work-life balance. Hi, everyone. My name is Kyla Brown. I'm from Family Ties of Westchester. I'm an employee there, but I'm also a resident of Yonkers. I have two children, um, ages 13 and six. Um, and so it's been a challenge trying to balance working as well as um, dealing with their academics. Um, one is in eighth grade, the other is in first grade. And so it's a little easier with the one that's in eighth grade because she's able to be a little bit more independent and do it on her own. But the one that's in first grade, he needs a little bit more hands-on. Um, so it's been very challenging. I ch with Yonkers, we started with online for everyone. Um, and then now that they've transitioned over into hybrid, I originally didn't want any of my kids to do hybrid, but because it's been um, very difficult for me to balance working as well as trying to teach him and keep up with the expectations of class, I've recently had to make the decision of sending him for hybrid um, learning. Um, there's been like distractions. So of course they use like, you know, their tablets or their computers. They're used to using those devices for, you know, fun things. So it's been kind of a distraction when different things pop up on the screen while they're on school. Um, it's been hard because you got to kind of keep a schedule. You can't wake them up right before class. You need to give them time. So that's kind of, you know, been challenging, making sure that they're up, giving them a chance to kind of, um, you know, breathe. Uh, it's also been hard to, um, with supervision of, you know, making sure that they're doing what they need to do while I'm also trying to work um, and monitor them at the same time. I've had families that complained about that as well because I have families that they have to work and have no choices and you know they're leaving their children to supervise themselves some of them aren't logging on at all um while they're at work so it's kind of hard and then with the expectations of like academics what's going to happen with that with overcoming um learning challenges of remote learning and if they're actually learning and the impact of like hybrid and if it's if they're if it's not consistent enough are they retaining anything as well so, are, and are they meeting, you know, the school's expectations while doing remote learning? So what happens when they do return to full time being in school, are they gonna actually be at grade level? And what happens, you know, when we do transition back into, you know, full time? Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Next, we have Luz Paguero on challenges supporting kids with special needs in the remote learning environment. Let me see if I can find you or if you can unmute yourself, either way. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Luz Paguero. I work in Family Ties. Um, I'm also a resident of Portland Manor, so I am within the Lakeland School District. I have a eight-year-old and a very crazy and wild two-year-old. So I will be focusing on the importance of ensuring kids with IEPs. Um, my daughter has an IEP. She, she receives um, several services through the school district. 
And it was definitely a challenge make, making a decision on whether having her go in person or doing 100% remote. So my, my decision, the decision that I made was I preferred keeping her home instead of having her going hybrid because it's not more um, that I'm worried about the infection rate. I was more worried about consistency. Um, my daughter, um, she doesn't do all the changes and having her go in and one day and the other day not go in person, it would have definitely affected her. So I decided to do 100% remote. I, you know, had to work around my work schedule, which I'm really glad they were able to, we're doing half at home, working half at home and then half at the office. So we started doing the remote. We had many challenges during the, um, the beginning. Um, my daughter um, has difficulty focusing um, to a point that, you know, me and the teacher are in constant communication. So what has worked for me is that me and the teacher has established a system on how to communicate daily. So what they would do is they were sending me an email daily on whether she participated, whether she participated in the chat, whether she completed the assignments and anything in the comment section on where she needs to work with. Um, I ended up having to hire a tutor to come two days a week um, to also give her additional support because like I said, I work from home and it's difficult for me to tend to her needs. And sometimes I feel like I don't, I don't have the tools or the skills to help her. So every Friday, I get a phone call from her teachers to tell me what goals we should set for the following week and if we have met those goals. Um, it's definitely been a challenge. Um, like I said, especially having a child with an IEP, I feel like I have to be more on top of her. Um, and certain things that maybe kids that don't have IEPs, you know, I have to worry on whether she's able to sit during the class time. It's a lot of screen time. You have to sit there on the computer from 8.30 to um, 2 o'clock. So she gets a little antsy. I had to buy fidgeting toys because she started peeling on the wallpaper. So I started witnessing that she was getting anxious. There was a lot of anxiety there. So then I had to talk to the teachers and communicate with them. So I was able to establish a, a, a good system with the teachers. I am in constant communication. I speak with them if I have any concerns. Um, they email me if they have any concerns or suggestions. And um, that's what has worked for me as up until now. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Luz. So yeah. next, we have Alessia Asiero on school discipline and how to support kids in the remote learning environment. Okay, sorry, I unmuted myself. I'm Alefia from Family Ties of Westchester. Um, I live in the community of Peekskill. As you know, many of the families we serve in the community um, have been infect, uh, impacted by uh, remote learning. Their stories are somewhat similar to my own. I live with my eight-year-old son and his grandfather who lost his job during the pandemic. We, like many families we serve, are living in, in uncertain times. Um, I think we've all sort of up, upped our self-care game since the brink of COVID-19, but like usual, uh, things get tough and we kind of forget about the basic needs of self-care for our own children, and many of whom feel very unheard and left out at this time. Uh, the truth is many of our children have been suffering emotionally and academically even before the pandemic. Uh, this pandemic has highlighted and exposed some serious flaws. Um, we have such an amazing set of teachers here in this community and community partners that really want to make a change for the better. Um, unfortunately, it's in these communities like Peekskill and Yonkers, you know, you see huge budget cuts where they actually need a lot of support and aids and people to really come in and, and fix what's, what's broken. Uh, rewinds the beginning of my son entering school. He loves learning and he couldn't wait to start his school year and school, you know, his academics. Um, but he now refers to school being like a prison and he's not just one of those students. I mean, there's many students who feel very constricted and, and felt like, you know, they're not being heard in the classroom and they're shy to like raise their hand virtually. Um, 
you know, they're, they're intimidated by that. And, you know, he even says things like, you know, I feel like my teachers are, are unhappy and it's unfortunate. You know, we, we want the teachers to be happy. We want the kids to be happy. And I feel like there's not one solution to this. I mean, one part of it is financial, but the other part comes from, you know, the way we approach our emotional needs of our children and how we truly value these needs, um, you know, are we really listening to them or are we blaming them? You know, and I think that's where discipline comes in. I think lots, a lot of times we just fall into this repetition of disciplining rather than seeing what can we change in the school system? What can we really do to support the teachers and the communities to provide opportunities to families and create more of a happier and, and uh, joyful environment? Um, I think studies have shown that grades alone don't equal success. You know, there's a great there's great value in a child's emotional wellness, and that it just can't be ignored. I believe we should move towards prioritizing this as a need and making sure that it's seen as an equal measure, not not just academics, but an equal measure to academics that their emotional needs are being met throughout the whole day. Um, and I definitely get calls throughout the day, you know, I'm in constant communication with my teacher and, you know, the problems with my son, you know, he'll unmute himself or go in the chat. And, and there's a lot of things that I could do to discipline him, which I do try to do, but it's, it comes from, you know, the stem that he's sitting for six hours straight, you know, virtually, and it's not natural for him to do that. He's not happy, he's not excited to be there. I think some of the solutions to that would really be like bringing in musicians, bringing scientists into the picture, bringing people that really engage the children, you know, and I think that there's ways around this that we can really engage the children more um, instead of just relying on discipline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alethia. So we're gonna transition slightly um, Yes, Michelle did a, a round of applause with the uh, reaction. Feel free to do that if, you're, if you uh, support what others are saying. Um, and thank you so much to all of the parents who just spoke. Um, you all did such a great job and, and I'm sure all of us on the line um, agree and support what you're saying. So I wanna give um, our legislators, Senator Mayor, Education Chair, um, and also legislator Chris Johnson an opportunity to respond. So I'm gonna give you each about five minutes. We'll start with Senator Mayer um, and then I will transition us to legislator Johnson. Thank you. So one, thank you, Carrie and Allison and everyone on this call. Thank you for having me and um, thank you for making sure the voices of parents are heard. Um, one of the struggles that we had in the whole period from March until September when school started again, is a concern that parents' voices are not heard in this conversation. And as the governor started to make plans and the state education department and they put all these rules in place to begin the conversation about how school should be open, I remain concerned that the voices of parents like we hear here today have not been enough part of the conversation. So that's just the outside of the politics. You have superintendents, you have boards of education, you have the teachers union, and then you had the governor who had the power to make a lot of decisions with the Department of Health and the state education department, which has its own authority. But where were the voices of parents? And not that you didn't have a voice from March till um, June, when the going was even tougher than it is now, if I had to guess, because schools really did not know what they were doing. And you were, you were home with your kids. So uh, one, I'm, I'm so appreciative that your voices are here today, and I'm appreciative of hearing your voices. Um, I, will, I, I will talk about each of the things, but I, I just wanted to say another point. This remote learning, or the hybrid, or whatever we have, expose the fundamental inequity in our school district funding and the ways our schools operate. So I live in Yonkers. I've been an advocate for Yonkers for a long time, but I also represent, along with the majority leader, New Rochelle, White Plains. I represent Port Chester. And as the chair of the education committee, I fought for the whole state, including places like Peekskill, Ossining, uh, New York City, the fundamental inequity is that the schools that are predominantly black and brown 
or that are in cities or suburbs or rural communities that are predominantly have lower income families have faced this crisis in a much more damaging way. And it's a challenge for us to try to right this ship. So the, there was a report this week from the Educational Trust that students from uh, low income backgrounds and students of color are disproportionately learning remotely this fall. They have less access to in-person learning. I understand the challenges with in-person learning, but these students are facing an even greater challenge because so many of them are home and learning remotely almost all of the time, as some of the parents here chose and understandably so. So I want to answer a deal with a few of the things that were raised. Michelle, you talked about what I think is so critical. You know, the school community did not like it when people said, but we have no place to send our kids and we need to go to work. But the fact is every working parent knows that schools are a form of childcare and we ought not to be hiding from that. We ought to have the school community, the childcare community and the after school community talking to each other instead of so siloed that all of a sudden in your case, Michelle, now you can't go to work. So you don't have the income and your kids are basically losing out on your income and your independence and your professional well-being and all the things that are established by your profession because we've created this system where the kids are home. We ought to have and we can do better in ensuring that the child care and after school and school community talk to each other get rid of these stupid ideas that they're separate little silos and they can't talk to each other. That is one of the things that several of my colleagues, as well as myself, one from a rural community and one from Brooklyn, we wrote a piece together, stop putting them in these little buckets where they can't talk. Because for working parents, especially working mothers, it's all the same. The kid goes somewhere, is well educated, you feel secure, and then the child comes home. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. Also the impact on child poverty statewide has been tremendously affected by the fact that parents are losing their jobs. Either they can't work or they got laid off or someone got sick and died and they have to take care of the kids. So it's really, really a challenge. Um, Celia, you talked about remote learning, particularly for uh, English language learners, all of the issues with computers. I wanna mention, I am putting in a bill, it's called eLearn, Let's Expand Access to Remote Now, that's going to require all of the broadband companies, the internet companies, to provide free internet service to every child in New York and every school building in New York for the duration of this pandemic. You know, the New York Constitution says there basically must be free public education. That used to be a pencil and a paper or a whiteboard. Now it means your kid is home. If you don't have access to broadband, you can't get a free public education. So I know Josh telling me to be quiet, and I will, but this bill is to force a conversation with these providers who are making money, selling their services, to say this is a pandemic, this is an emergency, it is time to provide free broadband to every child, regardless of where they live, every school building, and every school district. So. I'm gonna be pushing that. We're working on finalizing it this week. Thank you, Senator Mayor. And I also wanna welcome Assemblyman Steve Otis. I realized I did not acknowledge you earlier. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to legislator Chris Johnson who represents Yonkers. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, having me on this call. Um, I apologize for being on the road at this time. As you all know, when you have um, when you have children, sometimes timing gets messed up, and then you add on top of that um, what we're talking about here, the reality of working from home and what that means, and and then picking up a child from childcare and, and how all those things add up. So as uh, the majority leader said earlier, um, I do have a a young son, and so I'm learning all of the things that you all have already been through um, at this at this stage in your child's development. Um, and so can I, I can truly appreciate, you know, all the struggles that you all um, are dealing with. Uh, you know, the Senator, I, I currently sit in um, on the County Board of Legislators 
and it's where uh, Senator Stuart Cousins sat before she became a senator. And one of the reasons why she was excited to go to the Senate, um, as I learned when I worked for her, is is because she got to have a direct effect on education um, of children in, in the state and in the local communities. On the county board, we don't have a direct um, effect on what happens in the school district. And so I missed that from being when I was on the city council in Yonkers. However, um, you know, it's forced me to try to find creative ways in order to support our, our children and our families, especially now during this pandemic. And so to piggyback off of what Senator Shelley Mayer was just talking about, you know, I've had, I chair the, um, Social Services Committee, and uh, I talked with, we had a conversation about child care last week, and I asked um, our child care providers what the conversation was like with school districts around um, hybrid learning, what it was like with regard to after-school programs, because children after school often stayed in the buildings and, you know, had further experiences um, to further their education. And the response was that that conversation didn't take place. And so just as the senator said, the Office of Children and Family Services at the state level has to be able to talk to the Department of Education because the reality is they all do with children and their well being. Mm -hmm. should, should we try to come back to Legislative Johnson? Yeah. I think, Legislative Johnson, you're breaking up just a little bit. Uh, you might be driving through some kind of dead zone or something, but um, we can come back to you. You still have about two or two minutes left uh, in your remarks, so we can see um, later on in the event. Is he still in the meeting? I don't know if he, I think he actually- Maybe know. we lost him. So we can move on and circle back. All right, so we are going to move on to the question and answer session. And I want to invite Claudia Barbieri to start us off um, with her remark. And you have two minutes to do so, Claudia. And then if also, I'm sorry, if you want to speak, um, just write in the chat and we're gonna get to as many as we can in about 10 minutes. If we don't get to you, we will follow up with you uh, separately outside and connect you um, that way. Good afternoon, I'm Claudia Barbieri. I have two minutes, I'm going to speak fast. Okay. I'm speaking to you on behalf of many parents from Yonkers Montessori Academy. My daughter is currently in the seventh grade and she's a new student, middle school student in the building. Although we all agree that we're living challenging times, we should recognize that the education should be priority, but it seems that many teachers in this building are not feeling this way. Assign my daughter for the hybrid learning. I'm scared, but I did it. Hybrid learning began last week. 11 teachers were absent in the first day. In the second day, other 13 teachers were absent. This month, this Tuesday, 15 teachers were absent. This is the average for every day. Out of the seven classes that my daughter is supposed to be having seven teachers, she only gets a teacher one per day and maybe two considering the gym teacher. The teacher are posting assignments for the kids to do, it, to do it during the school hours. But my question is, who is teaching them? I called the school and they told me that I'm number 400 called with the same issue, but that I should be positive because the kids are happy because they get to leave the house. With all my respect, I'm sending my daughter to school to learn. I'm not sending her to a playground. So now my question will be for the Board of Education will be, what's the plan? A decision was made to deny all medical accommodation for teachers. 
did they see the consequence for this for the kids? What are we waiting for? Am I waiting for the teachers at Young Montessori Academy to use all their sick days, vacation days, personal days? And this can take up to months. So then what happened after? As harsh as it might sound, also the substitute teacher that she is having, they're more like babysitters. They're there just supervising the students, but they're not teaching the lessons. So finally, for me, is this a battle between the teacher's union and the Department of Education to see who's going to have, who's going to win at the end, who has more power now? But at the end, my daughter and the kids are losing in this battle. They don't have the teachers. So are we all playing innocent, innocent here, waiting that we all go remote? Is that the situation? The city should be more transparent with, that, with us about the situation. I feel that Jumpe Montessori teachers are not going to school. They're failing my daughter education. She doesn't have a teacher to teach her. So now I became the teacher. Kids are trying really hard. Parents are trying really hard. The last thing that I want to say is where are the teachers at Joker Montessori Academy? But most important, where is the leadership? Thank you. Thank you. Some important points brought up. I just want to make a note. Um, we were joined back by Legislator Johnson, and I want to also give in about seven minutes, we'll give him an opportunity to finish his remarks, and then also Assemblyman Steve Otis, if you um, are willing to speak, we'll also give you an opportunity briefly after Legislator Johnson. But continuing with um, Q&A. Uh, Josh, do we, we want to see if anyone, um, whether it is Shelly or, or Steve, or if yeah. uh, Chris is on to respond to um, any of the comments or questions that were just raised? I think we have some time for a little back and forth. There were some good comments, I thought. Mm -hmm. And, I, and, I, and not unique to one school or one city, I would imagine, Shelly, that, you know, you're probably hearing some of these same concerns um, in other districts, as I said, in other communities throughout the state. I think very bluntly, there is conflict uh, between the fear of many teachers about coming in the building and a sense of parents that, like, whose side are you on here? Mm -hmm. And I know Claudia for a long time. She's a fantastic advocate for the Oscar schools. And she knows that they do the best they can under difficult circumstances under normal times. But parents want to feel, and it's a completely correct feeling, in my opinion, from a policy point of view, that we're on the same page with the teachers. And generally, we have been. But this crisis has brought out some tensions that I've seen in Yonkers and elsewhere, to your point, as elsewhere. And I have encouraged the teachers union to make sure they are communicating more effectively with parents because they deal with the superintendents and the boards and that's who make the deals about how often you can come in and when you can take sickness. But the fact is they, in some ways, we need to be negotiating with the parents, not only the boards and the superintendents. So I, I, I really appreciate the directness of your inquiry, Claudia. It's, completely fair and I think there are safety concerns that teachers legitimately have but we have to figure out a way out of this and it can't be that nobody shows up that's not an acceptable solution in my opinion thank you Shelley mayor senator mayor if there is any response from um, any others on the line, Assemblyman Otis or Legislator Johnson? Um, if so, feel free to go or we can ask for another parent on the line to, to have a question. Oh, I'd love to feed in here and I think everyone's comments have been so valuable. And I, I think that it goes without saying these are unbelievably challenging times for all of our institutions, for the schools. They are just getting by running these schools. And I think that, that hearing from the the parents today underscores the real challenge, which is that uh, kids are the victims if we don't pay attention to the details, the individual needs, what's going on. And this is really uh, 
a, a challenge because if you look at the school districts and you look at, at how they're trying to coordinate who's remote, who's not remote, what teachers are available to do this, that, and the other thing, and then uh, kids with special needs, especially uh, uh, these are challenging times, making sure they're getting services that keep them going forward rather than falling behind. Very challenging times and very challenging times for parents who are trying to juggle all this and their jobs and their economic survival. So we have to, uh, I think as elected officials, put pressure on everybody to do better and especially to have our school systems pay attention to not just trying to function day to day, but also make sure that kids with their individual needs are not, are not ignored and that parents and their needs are not ignored. There are no easy answers and there's also a lot of not a lot, not a lot of money for these school districts to accomplish these goals. So uh, these are tough times, uh, but, uh, this session has been great because you've so articulated the fact that individual kids have these needs and they're not being met. So uh, I'm on the education committee in the assembly, uh, very uh, pay attention to these issues uh, as well in, in, in our house. So uh, thank you for letting me say a few words and, and thank you for having this, this uh, session. Thank you, Assemblyman Otis. Appreciate your advocacy and, and those words as well. Josh, we have a raised hand from Nicola. Okay, thanks, Tammy. Nicola? Hi, good evening. Um, I was I wanted to um, share that I think it's more harder for those who are going into a new school meaning that my daughter, she just graduated, she's going to sixth grade now. So today and between today and yesterday, I had to take it on myself to call them to ask, okay, I'm not, I'm my other son's school, I'm getting emails from, for, about things, his teachers, assignments, everything, um, when they go to the Zoom, be able to be connected. But with my daughter, I ain't received nothing. I'm like, okay, so how do I know when she's supposed to get on? Who's her teachers? Who I can I contact and I didn't get no information. So from today and yesterday, I call and I talk to someone. That's when I got the information I needed. But then they tell me, oh, well, you get an email. And I'm telling them, no, I'm looking at my email now. They say, well, maybe it's in the spam. Check the spam. I checked the spam. It's not in there either. So they verify my email. It was the right email, but still I'm not getting anything. So I don't know if because she's just her first year in the school. That's why we was having the problem and the miscommunication because they had half a day today. I didn't even know that. But it's a, a person who lives in my building, her son goes to the school. She called me, me and her talking, and then she's telling me this. And I'm like, no, I get no information about this. So now my daughter, she says she missed it, I think probably three classes because of miscommunication. So I remember someone earlier saying about she, it helps that someone communicate with her, that they have this communication that's open, that helps. I think that would help a lot because I know as far as my daughter doing it remote, she, as long as she knows to go into her class and she knows what's going on, she's doing fine. And with my son, Shamik, he's pre-K. It's a little more harder because his first time being in school and learning things. But the teachers, like I said, I'm constantly getting email and I'm constantly getting communication with them. So it helps. He also gets speech ther therapy. So prior to that, he's already doing Zoom. So that helps him too to be able to be patient and sit, you know, and do the work. So I'm not having any difficult day, but with my child starting a new school, there's no, no communication. And I think communication is definitely key right now. So I just wanted to bring that up because I, I heard prior someone saying that her, they're giving her communication and that's helping. And like I said, with my son, they're doing that too. That's helping. I don't want to be out there and lost because my, like I said, my daughter, her attendance always in school. I don't want her now, son, now you have an absence and they, because you're not in because this is the time for the end, but you don't know you're going to be in. And then there have been times she get in and she says she's waiting for someone to come in and it's not put her on. So I just think like if we could communicate and better have our kids prompt the timing to be on and how things should work, then it will fall into place better. 
that's that's just what I just want to share. Thank you very much. Is anyone would anyone like to respond to that? Just to say that I think it's a given, and you're right, Nicola, that there needs to be better communication. When there is communication with the teacher and the parent, or the school and the parent, it's 200 times better. Even if the news is not great, as long as they tell you, like, you know, your kid was this or that, at least you know. It's when there's, like, you have a half day and you didn't know, that's unacceptable. That is just simply unacceptable in my book. So, yes, communication. And I'm thinking that one of the things that might be helpful is to take this group of parents and make sure that our member of the Board of Regents, Fran Wills, who sits on the Board of Regents, which makes education policy, here's what you have to say. And if, if you are open through family ties and, and uh, the Westchester Children's Association to, to do that, I think it would be very helpful to have her as well because they have the ability to make some policies that impact how the schools are operating. Just would add, thank you, um, thank you, Shelley. We have partnered with the WCA and provided an advocacy training for our staff, and certainly would be more than happy to partner again and encourage other parents and family members to participate so that we can have a unified message because it really is about communication. Um, and, and you know, we do agree that we think that on an individual basis, everyone's doing the best we can. But I think if we all kind of hone in with the same um, goals in mind and we communicate, we can really address some of the barriers because, you know, thank you, Nicole. That's what we hear a lot is people just aren't getting the information they need to be able to support their kids' success. Yeah. That's, that's great and a, and a good segue. I'm mindful of time, but I did want to, if Legislative Johnson um, had just a few more comments to close out, otherwise I'll move us to um, the closing and kind of call to action. Uh, Legislative Johnson, are you there? Did you want to finish up any remarks? Just wanted to say thank you for, um, you know, having this conversation. And if there's anything that we can do at the county, um, I know I talked to Senator Shelley Mayer, um, and send it to a cousin, you know, from time to time. And if there's anything we can do at the county level to make this transition easier for children and families, we'll do so. And um, 3J is telling me that uh, we should wrap this up. <laughs> I think so. I think he's had the final word. It was better than your word, right? <laughs> Our children need all of us, that's for sure. So um, let me just sort of wrap us up. My name is Allison Lake, and I'm the executive director at Westchester Children's Association. Um, certainly a lot of good friends and colleagues and, and peers uh, on this call. But if you don't know, WCA is a multi-issue children's advocacy organization. We work on policy, budget, and system change that impact children zero to 25 years of age here in, in Westchester County. And so we came to this work around remote learning um, early in the COVID crisis, like many of you on this call, and particularly from the work that um, others have mentioned that we do around data. We base our advocacy on data, um, which is so important in a county as diverse as Westchester that we try to break that data down to the lowest denominator, whether it is a school district or a census tract or municipality, and even further than by race and ethnicity. And that's where we immediately saw, even pre-COVID, um, the discrepancies around access and digital access. Um, and so for us, it was really sort of a no-brainer to kind of jump into this with our partners. Um, there's been a work group of uh, stakeholders that includes some superintendents, um, some of the um, foundations, as well as the school district, community partners and advocates, the County Youth Bureau as well, all kind of putting our heads together. I think as you said early on, Shelley, you know, this, this hit all of us and there was a lot of scrambling um, to finish out the, the school semester, but now headed into um, this new year, which everyone knew this was coming, I think there's a lot of work to do. And so our work group has prepared a, what we're calling a remote learning advocacy agenda um, to do just what we really did in this town hall. And that is to get voices from different groups 
um, and try to say what are some priorities that we all want to work towards because unfortunately remote learning is not going away anytime soon um, and so we need to get better at it. I threw something in the chat, I think, when you were talking, Claudia, about communication in your school versus communication. I think it was Luce that she earlier was saying in her district, you know, are there best practices and things that we can share um, across? When something is working, we don't have to reinvent it. Let's share that kind of information. And so I wanted to, to let you know that as I said, we've put together this um, agenda. It's available on our website. And, and Josh, maybe you can just put our website in the chat for everyone to have access to. Um, and it's really two priorities. One is the um, technology access that we heard from um, earlier in terms of not only the devices, but consistent and accessible um, Wi-Fi that I know Senator uh, Mary is working on as well, as she said, with the telecommunication companies. This is gonna require all of us, public-private kind of partnerships to make this happen and make this accessible to families. Um, and so that's a big part of our agenda. And then the, the next area, which we are calling learning supports, is broad. And, and I'm, I'm so happy to have had this town hall because I think we will go back and sort of edit and add to our agenda, um, hearing your voices, because everything from the social and emotional supports of children, um, helping families who do not understand the technology themselves with some training and supports, understanding the language barriers that may exist for families as well. Um, and so doing that sort of digital literacy, not only for the students, but for parents and guardians, where they need it, how they need it. That's what we really have to work towards. And that's the agenda that uh, we are trying to build. And so if I leave you with a call to action tonight, it is to go on our website to look at this um, sort of draft agenda that we have. And let's be in communication on how we can improve it because our goal is then we would ask people to sign on to this. We want to give our elected officials at the county, at the state, even school boards, what they need to say, we have to improve this situation. Um, and we do that by all of us lifting our voices around a shared agenda. And so please take a moment, as I said, reach out to Carrie or Josh or I or anyone else um, that you feel comfortable with and let's work to improve it. The opening statement on our agenda speaks to the diversity that is Westchester. We know there are some families that have access and resources that other families do not some school districts that have access to things that others do not. So, so we understand that is the imperfect world that we live in, but at the end of the day, there are things we can do to improve the learning situation for all kids in this remote, remote time that we find ourselves for the future. So um, on behalf of, I think, Family Ties and our elected officials that were here to us, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, I know it is evening time and not, not easy to, to, to take that time away from family. So we appreciate your joining us and ask that you, um, that you stay with us, you work with us, um, if you did not get to ask a question or comment, put it in the chat. Josh will hang out a little bit so that we gather all of that. We did record this session so that we can go back, share it with the uh, Board of Regents, as you suggested, Shelley and others, um, and just help move the agenda forward. So thank you all again and, and have a great evening. Thank you so much for everybody's feedback and input and participation. We really yes. appreciate it. It was great. Have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank, Thank you. you.